know if anybody noticed outside, but uh, after uh, the Brit talked, uh, the skies, the clouds parted, and it's blue skies, nice and warm. Ready for my thing? Uh, let me introduce uh, Chris Stallings. Who's going to introduce the speaker? David, you probably shouldn't have told everybody it's blue skies like that. Trapped already. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. George Hunt. Uh, Dr. Hunt got his uh, PhD from Harvard University and then went on to UC Irvine for 35 years uh, before doing the opposite migration than, than most people from Oregon and Washington. He went north up to UW, uh, where he's been since 2005. And um, he's been a real pleasure to, to interact with over these past couple of days. It's been fun to get to know him. Uh, I think a lot of his, uh, his personality is gonna probably come out in his talk today. He's, he's grimacing over here. Uh, and one thing that, that I learned from him was that this is in some ways a little bit of a homecoming because he spent a lot of childhood years in uh, Clearwater Beach as they, his family would vacation and uh, do a fishing for snook and, and redfish and keen mackerel and these sorts of things. Um, Dr. Hunt has a very impressive CV. Uh, what's really impressive to me is not only the quantity and quality of his publications, but the extremely wide breadth of topics and journals that he publishes in. So uh, really looking forward to your talk and Dr. Hunt. <coughs> Yeah, good. Thank you very much, Chris. So, um, I got to admit, when I got the letter from Chris inviting me, uh, my immediate response was, eminent? Hmm. Ice melting? Glaciers? Hmm. Wrong guy. And he assured me that for some reason or other, um, the uh, biologists here had a slip in their thinking, and uh, it was me they were thinking about. <clears throat> what I'd like to talk to you about today um, it's sort of rolling together two or three different bits and pieces of presentations um, focused on the role of sea ice in the ocean and the implications of a warming um, Arctic or a warming ocean. I suspect you've all seen this. It looks great here. I don't know if you can see there, but that little white spot's what what was the left of ice. Um, I had to put that in given the comment or question yesterday about sea ice in the Arctic uh, Ocean. Uh, there's, there's just a lot less of it up there and uh, 2012 in September was the lowest we've ever gotten to. Um, there are winners and losers in this game. The, the shipping companies are delighted. The, the uh, Potential uh, waterways to, between Asia and the west coast of the United States and Europe uh, cut off an immense amount of, of time and cost in transporting goods from, say, Scandinavia around to uh, Asia. So there's a huge fraction of people who are very pleased to think about the possibility of a ship shipment of material costing almost a million dollars less to get from one place to another. There are also the oil folks who are pretty happy about um, the opening up of the Arctic and the, and the reduction in the amount of sea ice up there. Uh, clearly, you are all too aware of uh, the potential for trouble in what is considered a relatively benign environment in which to uh, obtain oil. It's clearly going to be a lot tougher game up there, and Shell um, got a, a real surprise, I think, in finding out how, how tough it was. Um, those are maybe the winners, shipping, oil. There are others that aren't doing so well. Uh, with, the, with the ice pulling back, uh, it opens up the, the fetch, the distance over which wind can work on the ocean surface, you get much bigger waves. Polar bears are unhappy. You get seasick out there on the ice a long way away. But from a human point of view, here's where the real trouble hits. Um, when you start having <coughs> ocean waves coming in on the coast itself, there's huge erosion problems. The, the underlying 
structure of the sediments there are about as stable as some of the sinkholes you have uh, with, whoops, sorry, uh, big, big areas of permafrost being uh, exposed. And so there's, there's, there's another clear um, set of, of, of losses for a lot of people. Well, a third topic up there that is bandied around at times is the potential for the Arctic Ocean to be a new uh, mega source of fish. That it might be a wonderful place to go fishing uh, for any number of different species. Certainly uh, some of the surrounding seas like the Barents Sea and the Bering Sea both have immense fisheries on them. And there's been a lot of talk about what might happen up there. So what I'd like to do is to talk about um, some of the aspects of the fisheries in the Bering Sea. Um, review a, a paper that I did with a number of other people long ago on uh, the role of changing ice, ice cover and uh, on, on how the Bering Sea ecosystem is structured. And one of the things I'm actually rather pleased about is that I, I think we've come up with information that says at least one of the assumptions was dead wrong, and it changes our view. It's ex that's part of science. It's, to me, it's, it's, it's um, you learn more when you find out you were wrong than when, when you prove yourself right. Uh, there's a lot of really nifty new information that's come together with the huge interest in research in the Bering Sea over the last five to six years. And then what I'd like to do, that, that sets one, one of the ways in which ice interacts with, with fish and fishing. And then I'd like to talk a bit about uh, the Chukchi Sea and compare it with the Barents Sea uh, just to set the stage. The Chukchi Sea essentially has no fishing in it whatsoever. And the studies that have been done, not very many of them, if you think the Antarctic is data poor, I can, can assure you that the Chukchi is, is, is much less well studied than the Western Antarctic Peninsula area. Um, but there aren't any fish up there. And so the question that I think is very interesting is, well, there's an Arctic Shelf Sea. Why isn't it, why isn't it having fish like the Barents does? And does that tell us something about the role of ice, and seasonal sea ice in these seas, and how the um, oceans may respond to change? Uh, of course, for acknowledgments, the first and the biggest one is a big thank you to the organizers of this symposium for inviting me. Uh, I really appreciate the chance to come down. Uh, but I also have to spend a lot of time acknowledging the large number of people who have helped me in putting together these comparative studies. Um, my own training is in, with, was in animal behavior and eventually working with seabirds. And even though I dabble in oceanography, um, I don't have the background. So I, I very often have to go to people, others who, who are willing to share their data, their graphs, and their ideas with me, and then I have the fun of synthesizing it and trying to, to build a story that's bigger than any one of the parts. So to start off in the Bering Sea, it's a place John Walsh helped introduce me to. Um, he, he, he knows this area right here. That's the probes area that he and others put a big study together. Uh, this shelf is about the size of the state's area, the you know, area of Oregon, Washington, and California combined. We look at this little map, and it looks like a tiny place. It's huge. And we've studied it up until recently with one, one vessel at a time that would go at 10 knots. I figured in 13 scientists. Uh, that's about the equivalent of four people on tandem, uh, three-speed bikes trying to understand the ecology of Oregon, Washington, California. Uh, it says where we, and that's our biggest fishery in the United States. And we don't put a lot of energy into trying to understand that place. So I'd like to talk to you about things that are going on down in this area here uh, as a starting point. 
Uh, it's the source of this really huge fishery for walleye pollock. Um, a not particularly attractive fish, but it's one that you get in uh, Mrs. Paul's fish sticks or any number of other uh, white fish. It's one of the major sources of white fish, along with tilapia. Uh, when we start looking at this, it's, you know, millions of metric tons come out of there. Um, and Dutch Harbor down in the elbow area of the Aleutians, right, right next to, to Unimac Pass, which is the closest pass to the Alaska Peninsula, has been one of the uh, lar most important ports for fishing in the U.S. The pollock catch has varied considerably over time. Uh, in the early period, this is a period of unrestrained foreign fishing. They overfished it, came down. We put in Magnus and Stevens act about in here. Uh, things improved. We knocked off a few areas that weren't quite as well controlled. And then we've had a little dip here, a fair dip, came back up for a while, and then it went back down. And one might assume that, that going up and down is quite a reasonable thing, but fisheries that have billions of dollars at stake really don't like to have things varying in ways that they don't understand. They, they, want, to, they want to have the ability to plan when you're building vessels that are in the hundreds of millions, you really like to know that you're going to be able to use it, and it's likely to be fished there the first year you get it out. This is, this is the hi history of the uh, modeled biomass. That is what the fisheries managers come up with as they try to figure out how many fish you can take out of the system next year. And what I'm, I'm particularly interested in is this period in here where the numbers of pollock, the biomass of pollock, dropped quite precipitously to lower to levels that we hadn't seen since presumably the early 1980s or late 70s. So I'm going to make this part fairly fairly brief. Um, we the, the up until the late 90s, we really hadn't come come to grips with how climate was going to be affecting the southeast and Bering Sea in terms of energy flow and what was supporting fish. And I happen to have the good luck to be out in two years, one of, one of which, 97, was, was really quite warm. And, uh, and then again in 98 when things were quite cold, or and, and sorry, in 99 when things were very cold. So here are two, 98, 90, 97, a very, very warm year, 98, a moderately warm year, and <clears throat> then 99, a really cold year. So you can see that the uh, mean temperature of the water was much lower in 99. Uh, a number of the species, the especially these larger calanoids in here that are important prey for the, for the uh, fish, juvenile fish, were much scarcer, much, much scarcer in 99. And we, a number of us came up with this hypothesis uh, that what was going on was that if you had early ice retreat, such as, as you might have had in 97 or 98, um, winds would keep the, the system stirred up until there was enough solar heating to st stabilize the water column. And at that point, you would have a bloom in relatively warm water, relatively warm being maybe three to six degrees centigrade. And because the conventional wisdom at that time was if things were warm, copepods would do well, and zooplankton would do well. They would grow faster, they would reproduce faster, so forth. We thought, well, following from that, you've got a, ni a bloom in nice warm water, you should have lots of copepods. And in contrast, if you had a late ice retreat here, 
then the, there would be, you'd be after the worst of the winter winds. The water would stabilize from the ice melt. So there's a little bit of ice melt. Um, we'd get a bloom, but that bloom would be in, in water that was minus 1.7. It would be really chilly. And we would get many, many fewer copepods. And with that kind of uh, reasoning, we came up with this idea of an oscillating control hypothesis. When things were very cold, uh, there wouldn't be very much food. There would be relatively few uh, offspring that would get from up to age one or two. And the, there would be uh, reasonably small numbers of recruits. Uh, but of course, if it got warm, then the thought was, OK, now we're going to have lots of lots of zooplankton, lots of youngsters, and lots of recruits, because there won't be many cannibals in here to eat them. And then, so these two are essentially bottom-up regulation of the system. And then as, as we got to a system where the biomass of adults and other big fish, cod, uh, arrowtooth flounder, increased, there was this sort of wall of mouths idea, and, and very few would support. So we were thinking that if warming hit the Bering Sea, um, we might have pretty good stocks of fish. And if you applied top-down fishing pressure on this, then you'd get back over here, and you'd have a reasonably strong regular recruitment. And that was a very attractive idea in a lot of ways, because it, it tied climate variability all the way up to fish production and the, the survival or, or health of other predators that, that required those fish. And we actually had some data that made it look plausible. This is the flat fish, because if, if, if you have an ice edge bloom and the copepods aren't there to use it, then the presumption is that that, that bloom goes to the bottom, feeds the benthos. So you'd argue then that when there's when there's an ice-related bloom, you should have good pr production by benthic fishes, whereas um, if the bloom is in warm water and there's lots of copepods, you're going to help the pelagic system. And this inverse relationship between uh, flatfish recruitment and pollock recruitment at least um, did not not support this. It, it seemed like it was a reasonable possibility. We also um, started getting data from a new program run by NOAA called BASIS. And it showed that in these years here, which were unusually warm, we had lots and lots of age zero fish, pollock, uh, being caught in their surface trolls. Whereas once it started to get cold again, they disappeared. And that also seemed like it was possibly supportive evidence, although I got to admit that there were those who were skeptics and said, well, maybe it's the, there's a difference in the vertical distribution of the fish, and that in the warm years, for whatever reason, they're up at the surface, maybe still trying to get enough food to get through the first winter, and then in the cold year, they've bulked up quicker and they go down. Um, and this is the kind of difference that you saw in the basis surveys. Um, a couple of, of warm years here, the, the redder the color, the more of these fish, the higher the CPU. E, and in the cold years here. So this all, all gave us this false sense of confidence that we might be right. And then we looked at, we got enough information to start looking at the production of age one fish. And here, 2001, here's, here's 2000. These were, the, these were the warm years. And we had just terrible recruitment of age ones. Not a single good age class for four, maybe five years while it was really warm. That just is absolutely not what we were expecting. And then as soon as it went cold, we started getting uh, quite strong year classes uh, following the, the shift. So it, it, it sort of is a, uh, actually it's a good teaching moment for 
uh, an undergraduate class, you say, well, what were your assumptions? We, we figured that warm water was good for copepods. Uh, we didn't think about euphousids. We just assumed they were available. We didn't think about, they are up on the shelf. Why wouldn't they be there? Um, the conventional wisdom that warm water was good for age zero pollock. Uh, they had a higher survival from the egg to the larval stage. They grew faster. That should be terrific because a fast-growing fish out outruns its, uh, the wall of mouths that are after it and, and it escapes a bunch of its gape-limited predators. And so you're thinking, oh, okay, this all should have been good for stuff. Uh, being warm was going to be nice. What we found, of course, was that the warm years did not lead to big year classes. Uh, Chris Baer and Jeff Knapp, shortly after our paper was out, uh, were able to show that one of the largest shelf copepods in the southeastern shelf, Calanus marshalli, needed an early bloom in cold water. And there are some physiological things there. Uh, maybe they're feeding on ice algae. Uh, they overwinter using stored lipids. Uh, those lipids could get exhausted. And the warmer the water, the faster they get exhausted. And they have to feed before they can start putting, producing eggs. So if they don't have some ice around, or at least some recently cold water, they may be in trouble. And we also found that, in general, the euphousids and this marshalli did not do well in the warm years, and that the little copepods did, which were not that interesting. So we, need, we obviously had some bad assumptions, needed some new data. And that was sort of a, you know, that, that opened up some more interesting ideas. Well, we, we've certainly heard about the Arctic warming. And here are these anomalies, and you can see it's all nice and red up here. But in the recent years, the Bering Sea has been as cold as it's ever been. It is disconnected from the Arctic warming. Its, it's, it's weather patterns are being driven by, by forces other than that which is driving the central Arctic melting. And I bring this up here because where I'm going next in this talk is about how cold the Bering Sea has been for the last, since 2006, and how that has given us an enormous opportunity to look at how that system functions, or functioned in the good old days when it was cold, and be able to compare it with the warm stands of years just before. And we don't have a lot of data from the from the warm years, but we have enough to, to have some pretty good ideas about things going on. And I think, so that's an exciting opportunity. It's one that we weren't necessarily looking for, but we got and we learned a lot from it. Uh, this is ice coverage in the, more or less the uh, halfway up the shelf, or a third of the way up the shelf. Here's what it looked like back in the, the 70s. Uh, Ice coming in early, maybe you know, in December, uh, certainly in January, sticking around until May or even uh, June or July. Um, and often very heavy ice, 10, ten tenths, 100% cover. Here's the early 2000s. Relatively little ice uh, and getting going away very early and, and not a substantial amount. And here's from... 2005, six on, reasonably heavy ice and staying around quite late. And some of the recent years have been some of the coldest we've had. Um, the ice does obviously cools the water. Uh, the whole water column, as that ice, that ice is advected from the north. It doesn't form in the southern Bering Sea. It's pushed down from the Polynias where it forms up in the north. Uh, it melts at its southern end and the Location of the southern end is the balance between the rate of melting and the rate of advection. In the wintertime, this shelf is stirred to at least 70 meters deep. Uh, been out there in March, you look at the water, you put a CTD into the water, you can't see it if it's more than a meter below the surface, and that's silt and mud that's been stirred up from the bottom. Iron is not an issue. Uh, for those who were wondering about availability of iron. 
but it does mean that the whole water column is minus 1.7, the, the level at which that water is, is uh, the ice is melting. And it also means that when that water all over the shelf gets a cap of warm water on it and a strong picnicline, which happens every summer, that cold water is isolated on the bottom as a cold pool. And so you can see here are the three, of the, three or four of the warm years. There's, there's essentially been no ice down here, no cold pool, no source, no source of ice algae down there, but also the bottom water is going to get warm. And down here, uh, several of the re recent years where the cold pool has gone all the way to the peninsula and um, it's chilly, especially by, even by the temperature in this room. Um, yeah, you know, I was warmer in Anchorage than I am here. <coughs> okay, uh, this is a messy graph, but this is the kind of data we had before. Um, until very recently, it, it may seem strange, the U.S. had no regular survey information on zooplankton in the Bering Sea. Zooplankton are the, you know, the pack repackages of all that wonderful phytoplankton that John was interested in, and nobody was studying it. These data come from the TS Oshoro Maru, um, a Japanese training vessel which took haphazard sets of samples over our shelf while training young cadets from Japan in the ways of oceanography and fisheries biology. But what it did show is that here in the late, in the early 2000s, the zooplankton, whether it was on the basin or the shelf, particularly the middle shelf and inner shelf, dropped down. And then it appeared that after that, it started going up. Well, fortunately, we have uh, we were out there uh, for a regular cruise uh, in 2004. Uh, that's really the only oceanographic work that was done there of a broad nature uh, in that warm period. But one of the shocks, and I don't understand why we got different data from the other time, was that um, in the warm year, the little guys may have been more abundant, but the big, the big things down here, the Calinus marshland, and the Calinoid copepods, just fell out of the system. And so this was a clue as to what might be going on with those weak age classes. Uh, Ken Coyle, about, from that, about the same time as that cruise, or just after it, put together a paper and showed that for uh, the large amphipods, uh, Thermista libellia, the, the Pacifica, the Calinus marshalli, and, and for that matter, a couple of other things, there were, were strong negative relationships between temperature of the water, whether it was the above or below the pic decline, and the um, amount of zooplankton in the water. So being a quick study, we came up with a new cartoon. Uh, we didn't do very much to it. But, but the, the important thing here is now we were arguing for um, lots of large copepods when we had the early bloom. And it turned out there was also lots of large euphausids then. And that the late blooms were giving us mostly just small stuff. Another thing that came out, out of the basis studies, um, which were a I think a real shock for all of us was that there was almost, almost a negative relationship between the numbers of age zero pollock and the numbers of age one pollock that were around in the following year. Uh, I think most of us work on the assumption that uh, more, a larger spawner biomass, for those of you who are fish, fish people here, uh, means more, more eggs and larvae. More eggs and larvae mean more age zero juveniles and, and on up the food chain. Well, it didn't look that way. And, and yet, the, the, in these cold years, there were lots more zooplankton. And, and I think something that was also 
a surprise to us here was it, that it took quite a while. It took three, two or three years, four years, before the abundance of zooplankton returned from, from the depression that came in the hot years. And I had never thought of, I, you know, maybe it's just because I'm a bird guy, but I'd never really thought of there being a spawner recruit relationship in Calanus marshalli or in, in the Euphausids. And here you can see a very strong relationship. It took, here's where it was, and it had been flat down here in the warm years, and then in the cold years, it took a while to build up again. The other thing, another, so there's a, a second clue. There's, there's more food around in the, in the warm, in the cold years, contrary to what we had thought was going to be the case. And I think, I believe these data. Um, Pay attention to these big black bars here. This is diets of young Pollock in warm and cold years. Well, here, 2003, 4, and 5 are warm years. 6 is intermediate. 7, 8, and 9 are, are uh, cold years. This is other age 0 Pollock in the diet of age zeros. They're cannibals, even as little ones. If I can eat you, I will. Uh, and what happens is that there's not a lot of, of euphausids in here, there's virtually none here, just a little bit there, virtually none here. But once it starts to get cold, we start to pick up euphausids in the diet. And we also, it turns out, start to pick up a variety of other uh, large copepods and such. So the diets of these youngsters were, were compromised. Not only, you know, and also, the same pattern is true with this three species of salmon there. Um, in the warm years, these black bars are eating age zero pollock. So they don't have to, they're not only worried about their brothers and sisters, they're also getting it hammered by other species. They become the prey of choice where there are no large zooplankton, which are probably richer in lipids than the uh, age zero pollock. And particularly in these cold years, the energy density, kilojoules per fish, of age zero Pollock were relatively low compared to these three years when the year class strength was strong. Year class strength was actually weak in 2007. The horizontal line is the energy density or the amount of energy in a young Pollock coming out of the winter in southeast Alaska. What this suggests is that these fish were going in in a condition, starting the winter in a condition that fish in areas where the fishing was, the, the species was doing well, were coming out of winter. So there was a high probability of, of starvation as well as just um, not get, uh, being eaten by somebody else. And, and most recently, uh, Hans Mutter has put together these sorts of graphs that suggest that if you really pay attention, that the age zeros and age ones both show a dome-shaped curve. If it's very cold, they don't do so well. But if it's, if it's starting to get up to nine degree water uh, on the surface, they're in trouble. They're starting, to, they're starting to get into a situation where their, their life histories aren't going to be helpful to them. So the new findings in this, we need an early bloom in cold water to get the big zooplankton. Uh, we need these big zooplankton to have sufficient energy for the age zero pollock to make it through to age ones. Uh, the age zeros are going to be the prey of choice for just about anything that eats meat in the uh, small meat in the Bering Sea, and with, we get this dome-shaped thing. So when, then a, a, another cartoon, which I find useful just in a general. Ooh, that's very strange the way that comes up. Um, is that when you have lots of copepods around. You get lots of little fish, but the big fish also eat copepods. It turns out that 70% of the diet or more, uh, when 
copepods and euphausas are available. The big pollock will eat, a fish that's a meter long. Uh, and under those circumstances, we're guessing that there's a whole lot less cannibalism and better recruitment than in other, other times. Okay, so conclusions. From this part, conclusion sub one. Uh, time of ice retreat affects the availability and size of copepods in spring and euphausids. And warm springs have mostly cold, uh, small copepods, but maybe good early survival of age zero pollock. Um, high numbers of pollock, age zero pollock, don't necessarily mean you're going to get a good recruitment later on. And um, when, when those big zooplankton aren't around, the, the little pollock are really getting shellacked by, by both their, their parents, as it were, and their brothers and sisters, and all the salmon that are running around. So try to, you know, just bring it back to ice. Um, the ice here is, seems to be a very important part of the functioning of this ecosystem if one is going to have strong zooplankton populations and uh, healthy uh, midwater fish populations. The implications are such that if, if we go back to the sort of situation we had in the early 2000s, we may well find that we have a very, very different Bering Sea in terms of fish population, particularly Pollock. And that's, the, that's the big money earner up there. The, one of the things that we saw in, since 2000 was that recently we've had stanzas of years that were similar. Uh, five years in a row of warm temperatures, now seven or eight in a row of cold temperatures. We don't know why, or at least I don't know why, we're, we've shifted to this sort of stanza like behavior. But in the past, you might get one warm year here or one very cold year there. But the fish populations and the zooplankton populations seem to be able to ride over a one-year dip. They don't seem to be able to have that resiliency when they're dealing with a five-year dip. And we may well be in a cold period now, but um, it's a good chance that eventually it's going to get warmer up there and we're going to lose, lose the sea ice in the southeastern Bering Sea. Um, Pollock are now a huge portion of the biomass in the, in the Bering Sea, eastern Bering Sea shelf. Who knows what it will look like when those go, but almost certainly anything else will either be slower growing, like Pacific Ocean perch and, and a Sebasti species, or will be less profitable. And so the fisheries that we've known and gotten used to is assuming are going to be there are likely not to be if it gets warm. And of course, we are seeing a resurgence in great whales up there now. But if the large zooplankton and the small pollock are scarce, uh, it's not clear what they're going to be eating. OK, I'd like to shift gears, uh, go a bit, quite a bit further north and ask why the Chukchi Sea has so f have, it should be has so few fish as compared to the Barents Sea. You, I'm sure, are familiar, but I will just remind you, the Barents Sea is here above Norway. There's Greenland, Iceland here, the Atlantic Current comes up here alongside of Svalbard, and some of it goes in here. Uh, the Chukchi Sea is here just above Bering Strait. Uh, the colors refer to bathymetry. This is very shallow. This is both shallow and deep. And I'll show you that a little more clearly here. Uh, there are two, so there are two sets of bathymetry maps simply because um, 
Jacobson prefers to include the shelf edge as part of the, bearing, the, the Chukchi, and the uh, IHO does not. But the important thing here is that a huge proportion, whichever method you use, of the Chukchi is less than 50 meters deep. And there's an important implication about that. If it's that shallow, if there are storms in the fall, it's going to mix to the bottom. And when it freezes on the, on the surface with ice, it is going to be cold all the way down. There is no refuge. Here, you've got deeper water, whichever method you use, in the Barents Sea. And that sets up the possibility of having warm, salty water at depths. I'm just giving you a clue as to one of the things I inter see interesting. Fisheries catches. It's hard to see here. Um, this is from the uh, Chukchi over on this side. And this gets up to, uh, I think, one metric ton, or maybe 1,000 metric tons here. This is one million metric tons. It's just the scale, the multipliers here. There's a decimal point here that's missing here. A um, huge difference in the fisheries. The variability in fisheries in the Barents Sea Catch is driven by variability in Capelin. These are cod and blue. Here, the, the major catch is salmon of one sort, of, pr primarily chum salmon. And essentially here, this is all a subsistence harvest by local people. This is a major fishery for Norway. Uh, estimates of fish biomass as opposed to catches are very hard to come by, particularly for the Chukchi. But you, will, you can see here that in the Barents, we're talking about uh, millions of metric tons. And all of these are commercially important, particularly the cod, saith, and haddock. Here, we're still in millions of metric tons, but you notice there's a decimal point. And the, essentially none of these are in sufficient quantity or quality to be of commercial interest. So uh, the estimated biomasses for the top five species of commercial interest is 8.9 million metric tons uh, in the Barents Sea. It's zero, and that doesn't include what some of the things that might be even more common but weren't in there in their uh, estimates. They don't, they don't estimate the biomass of non-commercial species like we do, 0.26 here. Water coming in to the two seas does quite different things. In the Chukchi, water from the Bering goes essentially straight north. This, the red is coastal current water nutrient depleted before it gets there, zooplankton depleted, uh, really sort of tired old water that came out of the Yukon and, and Kuskokwim rivers and, and up along the coast of, uh, of Alaska. Uh, this set of water masses coming up here came out of the Anadir current or off the Bering Sea shelf, loaded with nutrients and zooplankton. And then there's a very weak and sporadic uh, Siberian, East Siberian uh, current coming southward and being deflected around. Uh, except at the very northern fringe, nothing coming in from the Arctic Basin, and essentially everything that's being advected in coming from the Bering Sea down here. The Barents is really quite different. Um, you have Norwegian coastal water coming along the shore here, somewhat analogous to this, though I think richer in zooplankton. Uh, Atlantic water that's started in the North Atlantic, coming up out of the Norwegian Sea, um, relatively nutrient rich, relative, quite copepod rich, with Calanus finmargicus, uh, a, a very important species up in the, the North Atlantic. And it comes across going eastward before it goes up to the north. That means it has a long residency time here. And because this is a deep trough, it has the opportunity to warm the water, a, a very deep water column. 
And then there is Arctic water that comes in here um, and comes out around the south end of Svalbard. And that's important because it brings in copepods from the, from the north. There is ice in, in both seas. I'll get back to that. Um, temperature is something that fish are sensitive to. And for most, uh, most species of fish in the North Pacific, temperatures below the freezing point of their blood are going to be catastrophic. They aren't going to survive the winter. And fish blood in the ocean is generally of a lower salinity or lower osmotic pressure than is seawater. So if you've got water that is minus 1.7 coming through Bering Strait every winter starting in November or December and continuing to May, that is a very hostile environment for any fish that does not have glyco, glyco uh, proteins in their, in their blood to, to prevent freezing. Uh, this cold water originates down here in the northern Bering Sea, which is shallow and freezes every winter. And it will freeze for a long time to come because the winter is without, almost without sunlight there. The loss of heat from the water is such to the, uh, to the night sky is such that freezing will occur. So this is likely to persist regardless of what happens in terms of ice up here or even in ice down in the southeastern Bering Sea. In contrast, the um, Barents Sea is almost balmy. If you look at the uh, temperatures averaged for the Kola section, which is a section that the Russians have run across here, um, it never gets below three degrees. That's within the comfort zone of most of the large gadoid fishes, the cods, the haddock, and so forth. So this, is, this stays relatively warm all, all year. And there's also some of this warm water, because it's quite salty, that gets up underneath the Arctic water that provides yet another bit of a refuge underneath the cold, fresh Arctic water above. And that freshness is coming from ice melt. Try to keep with the theme. Um, Sea ice cover in the Chukchi. I'm afraid this slide is not doing itself very well here, at least as far as I can see. Uh, the, what you're looking, that's the ice edge there. And what, what one would be, what I would have hoped that you would have seen is that we don't really start seeing ice coming in until, uh, or, or rather the ice retreating and good things happening up in here until well into May. Uh, the, it, it's a slow opening up down up there. Uh, in contrast, in the Barents Sea, this is in April. And so all of this remains ice free all year round. Primary production in the two. So, so we've got a real difference in heat. We've got a, now what about primary production? Um, turns out primary production, a lot of people have focused on the fact that you get some, some regions within the Chukchi that are phenomenally high productivity. But if you try and, try and squirrel around in the literature, the means for both the Barents Sea and the Chukchi Sea are essentially 100 grams of carbon per meter square per year. Uh, that's not particularly high in the grand scheme of things. Uh, nitrate coming into the Chukchi is higher than in the Barents by a factor of two, but there's still not that much done with it. And it may be because there's a smaller volume. The export to the benthos, however, is greater in the Chukchi than in the Barents. And so we do have a stronger uh, benthic uh, population in the, in the Chukchi. Uh, this gives you a little bit of a map of the extent of, of high levels of primary production. It's an old map from Springer 1996, but I haven't found a better one yet in terms of someone willing to put numbers on a map. 
Uh, aberrancy, this is from modeling, and it really shows a very large portion of the Barents Sea with high levels of primary production in the south and then up in the north where the ice is present, uh, much less. Spring bloom timing, uh, you, you've got to get into June in the Chukchi before you start seeing very much in the way of primary production. In the, uh, in the Barents Sea, April is, is a good time to start looking for at May for the looking at primary production. So a longer growing season or an earlier growing season. And maybe it's the early that's important, just like in the Bering Sea for the copepods getting food from the ice bloom, it was having food early in the season that was important. Zooplankton biomass in the uh, Barents, um, generally higher. Uh, I've tried to set up coastal water here and coastal water there. Obviously quite a bit more in the Barents Sea than in the, than in the Chukchi. Anadir water is the richest water going into the um, Chukchi, uh, but it's, it's certainly no better than uh, the water, the amount of, of plankton in the Arctic water, let alone the Atlantic water, which is, is, really, is really potent. So, what we have then is in the trying to compare these two oceans, the uh, Barents is, is more productive in terms of fish stocks and fish catches. Uh, didn't take the time to show you birds and mammals, but, but it's not a very strong statement one way or the other. Uh, the most interesting thing is that for the marine mammals, in the Chukchi, a lot of them get their food from the benthos, whereas in the Barents Sea, a lot of them get their food from the pelagic. Uh, primary production, no significant differences. The Chukchi being much shallower means that it mixes well in the winter from top to bottom. It also means that there's a stronger connection between the pelagic production and the, zo and the, and the benthos. Uh, at least in winter, the Barents has large areas that are warm, whereas the uh, Chukchi, because of the freezing and melting of ice in the northern Bering Sea, is extremely cold in the winter, from top to bottom, north to south. Uh, I think the orientation of currents, people ask me, why do I put that in? I think that extra time that the Atlantic water spends in the southern Barents sets up the southern Barents as a, as a refuge area. And tremendous difference in the heat content of the uh, two water masses and in the amount of zooplankton. So, to give a summary, um, rolls of ice in the sea. In, in the southeastern Bering Sea, the late retreat of the ice is needed for the, the lipid-rich zooplankton and sets up a situation where there's the food chain available to support enormous fisheries. In the northern Bering Sea shelf, sea ice formation every winter and the attendant cold pool where the temperatures in the center of the cold pool are minus 1.7, block the northward movement of subarctic or temperate types of fish that aren't set up with the antifreeze to survive the really cold winter. So here's the situation where ice to the south is actually contributing to or blocking production to the north. And finally, the sea ice in the Barents Sea, which is only in the north, is important for the large copepods there, which are then advected south in Arctic water and feed both fish and birds and mammals uh, in the southwestern uh, Chukchi Sea. So with that, I'd say thank you very much for your attention. And this is what happens in the southeastern Bering Sea where you get an area where there are lots of euphousids available and hundreds of humpback whales and millions of shearwaters 
aggregate to feed on them. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Yes. I don't know. I believe there is. I believe we get larger diatoms when it's cold. Uh, I think that the lipid content of the zooplankton pri at the point of egg laying is from the literature rather than from direct observations. But given the big Bering Sea study that's just, just sort of coming together now in terms of conclusions, I think there may have been people who, who looked at the lipid content. I know that Evelyn Lassard and others looked at feeding rates and the copepods and euphausids, the large cop calanus copepods and euphausids, both were very happy to chow down on under ice algae and the early bloom algae and uh, underwater photography or, or video showed uh, at least moderate numbers of, of euphausids feeding under the ice just as they other euphausids do, superba dust in the Antarctic. Yeah, Steve. Thanks for a great talk. Um, if, if, um, the past is prologue, I think, you know, it's going to be an interesting time up there. And uh, toward that goal, cross neuters showed in the warmer years that there was uh, range extensions from the southern part of the uh, Bering to the northern part. Right. Uh, and even to the point where some surveys in the, in the Gulf were showing that the, um, uh, new species were being introduced there that hadn't been there in the past. So I wonder if, um, even if, um, you know, as, as, the, as the, the Arctic Ocean warms up, that we might actually get subpopulations of new species that do, that are, you know, basically um, you know, exported into the Gulf of Yeah. I, I think that with Franz's paper, um, Franz Mutter did a really nice look at sort of the, the centroids of, of subarctic or temperate zone fish and, and maybe in the, on the eastern Bering Sea shelf. And he found that when we had a warm period, there was a movement to the north. Turned out that it's also a period where the populations of some of those species were growing, and so some of that movement was was almost certainly density dependent driven uh, that the the straight temperature part only covered about 30 percent. They also did not get into the northern Bering Sea. They went up into the sort of 60 degrees north which is now sort of seen as a rough dividing line between the southeastern Bering Sea and going places north. You're right, there are also records. Uh, Libby Lagerwell of NOAA uh, recently did some surveys and found Pollock and other things north of Barrow, Alaska on the coast. And you say, ah, so much for that great theory. Well, number one, they were small and scrawny. So they, there was no sign that they were going to mature and do what thrive. The other thing is that if you get to the Arctic Basin, at about 200 meters depth, at about 200 meters depth, there is Atlantic water. And Atlantic water is coming in at three to four degrees. So the barrier is the northern Bering Sea and the Chukchi. And if you get through that barrier in summer, you ride the right current, you might get yourself into the Arctic Basin. And if you have the sense to dive, you might find warm water. Quizzing Ann Hollowed, who's fish meister extraordinaire, um, at NOAA, her reaction is, but you know, those pollock don't normally go down to 200, 300 meters depth in the, when they go off the shelf. They're still in the upper, upper water column. So it's not clear to me that they're going to make it. The other species that's 
quite promising are, are snow crab. And they're up there. Um, there were reports this last month, two weeks ago, that there are large ones up there, of almost commercial size. But there's also the suspicion that they're not maturing up there. So this, that area may be a dead end where things that are capable of getting there as larvae or juveniles riding a current might be able to survive, but they're not going to thrive. That's, and, and I don't think the temperature change, temperature situation is going to change up there. We may get a, a, with warming in the Chukchi, we may get a longer growing season, we might get more productivity, there might be more stuff going to the benthos, but it's still going to freeze in the winter. And in those shallow waters, when it freezes, it's cold to the bottom. And so if you're not equipped with your wetsuit or your dry suit, you're in trouble for that, that period of six months of the year when it's sub-zero. Uh-oh. George, uh, good talk. Um, for an ornithologist, you spend a lot of time on the bottom-up controls. <coughs> How about top-down controls? Oh. There are some very, very interesting bits and pieces that suggest that at the top there's competition for food. So that the, there's not enough food to go around, I suppose that's top down. Uh, that, that the, if you look at salmon, there is a negative relationship between the size at return and the age at return, and whether you went to sea in a year with an odd numbered year versus an even numbered year. Now this has not got something to do with flipping cards. It's got to do with the fact that Asian pink salmon have huge runs, monster runs in odd numbered years. In even numbered years, their runs are small. And so we're seeing a negative impact by Asian pinks on chum salmon and sockeye. Just been working up with somebody at NOAA a uh, paper on indicators and using seabirds as indicators. And it turns out, um, with a little bit of statistical magic, you can find a sawtooth in the uh, productivity of, of kittiwakes, a, a, a bird that's and, and thick bilmers that are flying out into the basin to forage on small fish. So is that sawtooth coincident with the Asian pinks? Yes. And it goes for, you know, like 60, 18 years. So this isn't, it isn't so something that we just conjured up on two years of data. So I think there is some top-down control of zooplankton by salmon. Certainly people have argued that's true for uh, Pollock, but we're really having a hard time now. I'm charged in a little, with a group that's trying to do some uh, synthesis of the Bering Sea work uh, to see if we could show top-down or bottom-up control uh, looking at, uh, say, Pollock and Euphausids, and on sort of a regional scale within the southeast and Bering Sea, uh, there tends to be when, when uh, euphausids are up, so are pollock, which doesn't argue for a top-down negative relationship between the two. I think the jury is still out on that, but it's, it's going to be, very, it certainly is top-down in terms of fishing, but uh, whether there's a really traceable trophic cascade, um, somebody like uh, Bob Payne would probably be able to tell us yes. Yes. You, you use the term uh, ice retreat. Did you mean ice melting? As sea ice melting? Well, and if you do, are there nutrients in that ice that it makes It both melts and retreats because the thing that pushes the, gets the ice back really fast is when the wind turns around and comes from the southwest and we get a warm wind. That ice is just 
pushed down in the, in the winter time, it can move tens of kilometers a day, and it can get pushed back equally fast. So it's not just the amount of cold water that's generated, cold fresh water that's generated is from melt, and that requires the ice to be in place for a while, because it's just sitting there, the edge is melting. Um, as for nutrients, it's for sure that there, there's iron in there, but it's not terribly limited. I don't think the ice brings a lot of macronutrients. Uh, it looks like the macronutrients are available are a combination of in situ regeneration in the benthos and on shelf advection. And we, the, some of the really astounding stuff that we're finding is uh, with better models and with lots of floats and gliders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, we're now getting a, the picture that there's several regions where there is quite strong cross-shelf flow, that there's upwelling and downwelling. And these are, these are things that uh, a guy named Seth Danielson's been working on. And it, it really changes our view from the old days, which was of a shelf that was sort of divided in sectors across the shelf and that there was minimal flow except for whatever came from tidal stirring. Yes? So sorry for the point. I'm a chemist. And I know. My oh. understanding of, of the Bering Sea is probably from the deadliest catch. Um, <laughs> so can, Good opera. Can sea ice be considered, or ice in the Bering Sea be considered to be found in when it was cold times, you had higher yield, yeah. warm times, lower yield? Are, is sea ice acting like a marine protected area? And that in the warmer times you have just a larger Feeding zone. Yeah. Um, the ice itself is not, but the cold pool is. Very good point. That the um, euphousids are like it cold. The adult, young pollock will tolerate cold down to say zero, maybe one, minus one. No, zero. The adults don't like it below minus two. I mean, plus two. So there. The cold pool does set up the potential separation of predator and prey. <coughs> and that is probably important, but the adults tend to move out to the shelf edge. And certainly they're pushed out to the shelf edge if there's a big cold pool, but they tend to be out there anyway. Arrowtooth flounder, another voracious predator, um, really doesn't like getting cold. And so that cold water does provide somewhat of a refuge, but it's still, if it gets down to minus 1.7, it's pushing the physiological limits of some of these characters. And we do find some there, and the question is why and how? You know, how do they survive down there? And I think this is going to start asking questions about genetics and uh, diversity of, of, of an adaptive uh, options because we we tend to look at the ocean the way we see, you know think of the ocean as as being the way we see it not that that is a transient stage and clearly what's going on up there everything is transient and that could include the physiological ability to cope with cold I mean the, I think that one of the things that's that's in a sense that we're learning in, uh, about fisheries in general is that models built on the assumption that the ocean is going to be like it was last year and the year before and the year before and that you take fish out and nothing changes except that you took those fish out um, is not a particularly viable long-term solution. It's fine for saying how many you can kill tomorrow, but if you're asking what's going to happen to the structure of that system and the fish you want to fish, you need to be thinking further out, and you need to be thinking about mechanistic connections. Oh boy, I got. I, ah. <laughs> Steve. Yes.
Oh, yes. You, we are doing wonderfully up there. Oh, you should. <laughs> I want, to, I want to create a little envy down here for those of you who deal with local fisheries. I'm on the SSC, Scientific and Statistical Committee of the North Pacific Fisheries Council. When we started seeing the pollock going down, people wanted to know what was going on. Fishery industry did. And when, when we did our, for two or three years, we ran the models and it said you could take X. And Uncharacteristically, the authors of those models for those species recommended taking a little bit less than the model allowed, to be a little bit extra precautionary because we weren't seeing the zooplankton around and we were a little worried if it stayed warm. Each year we were just fishing down the population further. What's really interesting is that industry people came up to us and said, are you sure you're being precautionary enough? Now, think about that in happening in New England or down here. The fishing industry, the guys who own the boats, coming up to the scientists and saying, we like what you're, we don't, we're not happy about seeing the fish going down. We're concerned. Do you think we ought to take fewer fish this year so that we keep these stocks healthy for the long haul? Yes. <laughs> You mean you don't? <laughs> well, here's, here's the other thing. Um, you know, a, a rasty old guy named George will take some credit for this. We used to discuss the ecosystem last, after we'd set all the tax, or, or all the ABCs. Pardon. We, the science group doesn't set tax, we set ABC, allowable biological catch. I worked with a couple of guys from Rasco, and we turned it around. So the first thing we discuss every time is the ecosystem considerations chapter. And we have put, gotten all of the plan teams that are doing the individual assessments to put an ecosystem part, part in their chapter in addition to what's in the general one. And we really hold them to it. You know, what, what's going, is this system looking like it's doing well, or are there, it's hard to get leading indicators, but are there any suggestions that things might not be so good next year so that we need to, to think about what we're doing? And it's, it's, it's very exciting to, to actually be working to try and figure out how to, to look ahead and having the industry being supportive. I mean, that, that makes all the difference in the world that the, that the, the consumers of our product are actually seem to be glad that we're doing it. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me like there's been a big sudden increase in fisheries interest in that area. Is, is that what's driving it? I don't think so. Uh, I think many of the, the U, as of say two years or three years ago, especially given Franz Mutter's paper of, of seeing things moving north on the Bering Sea shelf, there was, there was this mixed emotions, excitement that might be a whole new place to fish, uh, 
a little bit of trepidation that that meant going an awfully long way from any infrastructure that would support port facilities and transfer of fish. The last year or so talking to industry folks, I don't sense that interest or desire to get up there. And in Japan, I think people are resigned to the fact that the central Arctic Ocean is not going to become a suddenly wonderful fish basket. Uh, there was a really nice paper by Karen Ashton from Woods Hole uh, at a meeting up in Anchorage week before last. Maybe it was last week. Uh, I guess it was last week. That, that tried to model how long a production period would you need in the Arctic Ocean for the Arctic species of large copepods to complete a life cycle. And it was essentially one, until you got to a, a lot longer than it is now, a completely ice-free Arctic Ocean. And then they were only going to be around the fringes. They were never going to be in the, in the very central basin. So they'll get advected there, but you won't get massive populations. So you're not likely to get lots of fish up there. And I think the uh, cooler heads are, uh, who are looking at the bottom line are not, not thinking they're going to be fishing up there anytime soon. Well, my question was a little different than that. I mean, there's a, a hell of a lot of oil in the Trump Sea. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Shell spent $2.7 billion for that lease. Uh, and if they start producing up there, I would think that would stimulate a lot of money for fisheries research. It already has stimulated a lot of money, and it will stimulate yeah. a lot more. So if you're asking about fishing for dollars, the oil activities up there are going to be tremendous. Um, but you're not going, you're, the research will probably be done on what happens, what are, how is the Arctic going to change and how might it absorb or not absorb oil. Um, the end of this month, beginning of May, there's a meeting in DC to try and develop something like was done for the Bering Sea, but for the Chukchi and Beauforts combined. And that, the, my understanding of what's going to happen at that meeting is they're going to be looking for some overarching themes or ideas that might provide a focus for a study um, that would result in, in a multi-agency call for proposals to work up there. That's, that's my, my sense of what they're aiming for. So yeah, there's a lot of interest. Okay, yeah? What's Steve? That? Sorry, Steve. I'll <laughs> oh, come on. I'm still good, you know, I haven't fallen over yet. I'm not sure. Uh, there, there are part of the, this big Bering Sea program includes a group of people working on the Pribilof Islands and over on Bogoslav Island, which is a little island out in the, in the edge of the basin. And uh, I don't know by year what their results were, so I can't tell you that. I can say that I have been working with a postdoc to examine the data set on seabirds for the for the Eastern Bering Sea Shelf that started in 1975 with the NOAA BLM Outer Continental Shelf Environmental Assessment Program, and has continued up to now. We've got you know hundreds of thousands of records, millions of birds counted, and all this nonsense, and. We've been looking, I, we've just done a paper we've submitted on seasonal variability in the southeastern Bering Sea and how the birds are dividing up the shelf. Um, as sort of a teaser to get this guy to keep working on it, because he's now doing it for free, the money's gone. Uh, I, I persuaded him to, to look at the five warmest years, of the, the third of the years that the war, were the warmest and the third of the year that were the coldest. And there's a really quite considerable shift in the distribution of birds across the shelf. 
And what's interesting, is, I can't remember which way it goes now. I could 50%, I'd be right. Uh, the woes, those that are inshore move offshore in years of cold, I'll say. And those that are out in the basin also move inshore. So th there's something really strange going on there. And I don't know what it is yet. Don't have a, don't have a hypothesis. But yeah, I think they're going to be sensitive to that. Um, there are counts of birds on the colonies uh, in, in plots. There are estimates of hatching, uh, laying dates and hatching dates. There's fledging success. Uh, I don't think for the most part they get growth rates of the chicks. Some places they may. And then uh, some food habits data. So, so the, they, they get a, a, a wide range of things. And, so it, 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 it will be possible, I think, in the long haul to, to look at that. And at least the Pribilof stuff started in 75 when I went out there. So with only a couple of years missed, we, really, we can talk a lot about how things went in relation to various aspects of the, of the Bering Sea. And in particular, I think we, we haven't done, but we need to do things like taking lags because a lot of the indices that uh, Stephanie Zador and I have found in this last study I just mentioned earlier are lagged by one year or two years, which su suggests that if in a poor year, for whatever reason, the birds work very hard, the next year they, they've, gone to, they've left the colony stressed and that either affects their coming back or their ability to get enough energy together to produce eggs the next year. Yeah. It's a relatively new effort. Yeah. It just rolled out last week. Oh, good. And, and uh, because even when it's new, you can you do satellite data or crew data to recreate histories. Mm -hmm. And um, going back at least 10 years. Uh, and in some cases, I think for sea ice, you probably go back a couple hundred years. So you don't yeah, well, sea ice is probably <laughs> there. But now, what about, what about the hydrates? <laughs> but of course, in the Bering Sea, we could go back hundreds of years to, to look at John Walsh's data. <laughs> you're gonna, Steve, you're gonna, you're gonna see George this evening, so unless it's a, you will have an alcohol review. Great. I've got, Terrific. I've got just a couple of announcements, a couple of thank yous, and then Jackie will close it. Uh, announcement one: uh, students, you guys taken care of this evening. There's a TGIF with hamburger.
of change. And so we had the example from Jim Kennett of spectacularly fast rates of change associated with a catastrophic comet impact for the, for the younger Dryas. And then with Ian's talk of trying to get the rate of change of sea level rise and ice melting and what's reasonable and what's not reasonable. And then the rate of change at both poles, both in terms of ice and biology. And uh, Bob Whiteberg is not here today, but you can let him know that I said what he would want to be said at every meeting. The physical oceanography is really important. <laughs> Ben or 